Hey, what's up, Eric? Hey, Tino, what are you up to? Working on that power system layout. I sat with the customer, so I know what the goals are for the facility, and I've built in a lot of the reliability that they need. I also included the generator and transfer scheme and everything else that I think they need. I'm comfortable and hopefully plan to exceed their wants and needs. I'm just a little bit hung up. So you don't know how to size the electrical equipment or what's your issue? Nah, it's not really that. It's more so about the codes and standards I have to follow. I'm worried whether or not I'm going to pass plan review. Joe rattled off a bunch of standard document numbers that I got to follow that plan review is going to be comparing my design against, and I don't even know where to start. Yeah, you're right. There are so many to navigate through that it can be a challenge. You want to meet the customer needs, which are probably going to exceed the minimum requirements of the code, but you want to make sure you don't miss something. So where do I start? So why are codes and standards important for electrical equipment? There are really two reasons. First, it is important there are industry standards to ensure equipment and systems are designed and built consistently. And secondly, which is equally if not more important, is the aspect of safety in these designs. Just like other industries or things in our personal life that you may run into every day but you don't think about, like when you go to pump gas in your car. The size of the pump nozzle and the size of the hole in your fuel tank are matched perfectly. In fact, have you ever tried to pump gas and realized that you grabbed the diesel pump instead and it didn't fit? Well, similar to that example in the electrical industry, fuses and fuse blocks are sized so that they fit together to match opacity and voltage ratings so you don't accidentally use the wrong fuse. There are literally thousands of similar examples that you can probably think of in the electrical industry. Some of these examples might include wiring devices, like plugs and receptacles, switches and their covers, wire color coding, paint colors, and enclosure types. So what organizations or managing bodies do we need to think about in the electrical industry? In North America, the standards that we normally think of include NFPA, NEC, IEEE, UL, NEMA, ANSI, IEC, and CSA. Generally, outside of North America, some of these standards still apply, but IEC and others are more prevalent. From a historical perspective, we learned that as our country grew, both in population and in technology, statistics and events prompted the development of not only the codes and standards that make things safer, but even organizations that manage those documents. So here is a short summary of some key organizations and standards. Notice that many of these standards started around 1900, when electricity became more readily available, resulting in loss of life and property. You have the NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association, that started in 1896, and its goal is to eliminate death, injury, property, and economic loss due to fire, electrical, and related hazards. The NEC, or the National Electrical Code, hit the streets in 1897 and began as a result of the united efforts of various insurance, electrical, architectural, and allied interests. We have the IEEE, which is the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers entering the ring in 1884. Underwriters Laboratories, or UL, just one of the nationally recognized testing laboratories came into existence in 1894. These guys set the industry-wide standards on new products that enter a global marketplace, making sure those products are safe. You've got NEMA, or National Electrical Manufacturer Association in 1926, ANSI, the American National Standards Institute in 1918, the IEC, the International Electrotechnical Commission in 1906, the CSA, the Canadian Standard Association, can be traced back to as early as 1919. Just think about it. When did these organizations come into existence? The early 1900s and the late 1800s. What was going on in this country during this time frame? We were mechanizing, growing in population, and using new inventions and technologies to get work done. But unfortunately, lives were getting lost and property was getting damaged. That's why we needed these types of codes and standards and organizations. 
These organizations are nonprofit entities that rely on memberships of individuals and organizations to continue their work of increasing safety, saving lives, and property. While all of these codes and standards are important, let's focus on the National Electrical Code and talk from a general perspective. What it is, who is responsible for it, how is it laid out, and how is it used? After all, the National Electrical Code is a complex document that you do not just jump into. The National Electrical Code is an installation code, not a design guide. Every three years it's updated and the custodian of this great document is the National Fire Protection Association, the NFPA. It's important to remember though that the NFPA doesn't write what's in this book. The authors of this book are you and me and anyone else who makes public inputs and public comments throughout the process of this revision. You see, there are upwards of 18 code-making panels which are comprised of experts from various industries who review and vote on inputs made by the general public. This document follows ANSI processes, which govern its development from not only the process perspective, but also the makeup of each of those code-making panels. These panels are balanced such that not any one industry has more influential power than another. For example, I sit on co-making panel two, representing NEMA, and at the table, I have a representative from the IBW, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, the IEC, the Independent Electrical Contractors Association, NECA, the National Electrical Contractors Association, UL, Underwriters Laboratories, an industrial representative, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, and the International Association of Electrical Inspectors, the IAEI, just to name a few. Each of us, have only one vote, but we all work together to increase safety throughout the development of this important document. With the introduction of every new version, jurisdictions across the United States and even globally work to adopt the latest it has to offer. There's an academic approach and a practical approach to understanding the National Electrical Code. What we'll talk about here is the academic approach, but we're going to mix in some practical examples to help you understand the importance of knowing the structure of the code. This isn't a book that you read from front to back. Hold on, Tom. You mean I don't need to read this book from the front to the back? That is how we read books, right? Well, Eric, here's the deal. A lot of people will think I need to read Article 90, then Chapter 1, then Chapter 2, etc. But in reality, the everyday user of the code will bounce around from chapter to chapter in no given order to get something done. Article 90 is an important article for us to understand because it helps the user of the code to understand some fundamental principles in its application. But we don't just read Article 90 and never have to go there again. You'll find yourself accessing every single article in this document numerous times until you can simply reference a section off the top of your head. Whoa, whoa. What is an article in a section? You lost me. Well, Eric, let me tell you of that little bit of information that you're not going to find in the NEC. I learned it because of my involvement with the IAEI and going to their educational programs. This is something that we learn from each other, but there's a document that has all of this information in it and it's called the NEC Style Manual. Now, that's a little bit of information that you don't find in many educational programs around the NEC. In fact, it is important to understand the proper terminology so we all speak the same language. Oh, okay, I see it, Tom. The Style Manual tells me that the NEC will have chapters articles, parts, sections, tables and figures. It says it has exceptions and informational notes. Oh, and by the way, there's annex material as well. Oh my, thank goodness. We have index. Now you're talking my language. Exactly, Eric. The index is very important to help us navigate the code. But I'll tell you that if you understand how the code is laid out in those chapters and articles and parts, you can become even more proficient at finding what you need than using that index. There's logic to how the NEC is laid out, and once you understand that logic, you can understand how the content interrelates to each other throughout the entire document. So what you're telling me, Tom, is that if I understand how this book is laid out, and if I'm working on a motor trying to figure out the requirements, I'll be able to quickly find what I need to in this book. Absolutely. Great example, Eric. Motors are very common electrical equipment, right? If I look at the chapters in the National Electrical Code, I can safely assume that a motor could be considered equipment for general use. It's definitely not a special occupancy like I find in Chapter 5. It's not special equipment like you find in Chapter 6 
or special conditions like in chapter seven. Chapter four, equipment for general use is a great place to start looking for motor requirements. And in fact, article 430 is titled motors, motor circuits, and controllers. Wow, you narrowed down the entire book to one article pretty quickly. So is that all I need? Article 430 for motors? Well, Eric, I wish it was that simple. If you read Article 90, you would understand that there are other chapters that can impact your installation. For example, wiring methods and materials for your motor installation are governed by what's in Chapter 3. And oh, by the way, if your motor is in a hazardous location, you may need to look in Chapter 5 for special occupancy requirements. This is what I mean when I say the NEC is not a book you read from front to back, it's a book you learn to understand based upon your real world experiences in applying it. Geez, I never realized how complicated just one document could be. But I think I get how important it is to have an overall understanding of how some of these codes and standards are laid out. Yeah, Eric, it would probably be worth our time to dig a little deeper into this document itself, as well as understand other codes and standards that relate to projects that we all work on. Yeah, the NEC is one thing, but you also have the life safety code, energy codes, and there are a lot more. To learn about codes and standards of electrical power systems, contact us or your local Eden representative to schedule a visit to the Power Systems Experience Center today.